Can you believe it? It actually works. The all-wheel drive Mustang actually exists. Welcome to episode 25 of the all-wheel drive Mustang project, Project Traction. For those new to the channel, I've converted a 2017 Mustang to all-wheel drive. This video is going to cover the last few steps that were required uh, to get the thing on the wheels and drivable. But I know everybody wants to just see some more all-wheel drive action first, so here's a small taste. That was awesome! So much snow flying. So there's more of that at the end of the video, so you watch all the way to the end. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to cover the last few things that had to get done, mostly the CV axles and the exhaust. So there's a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Long term I intend to machine some axles from scratch. But to finalize the length I made some welded axles and they turned out so well I decided to run with them for the initial test drive. But the first step is getting some outer CV joints and the outer rear Mustang CV joints I am using are, are not serviceable from the factory. They basically don't come apart because there is a step in the inner race of the joint that doesn't allow the clip to come back out again once it's snapped in. To, thus to make my temporary axles I had to sacrifice two sets of axles. One set to save the CV joints and one set to save the axles themselves. To save the CV joints and get them off the axle, you have to cut the axle short enough such that the race can be rotated enough to get the balls out and then the race and ball cage can be taken out of the CV joint. I made sure to keep the part straight and use the same race and cage and all the balls when I put the CV joints back together later on. The next step is boring out the remaining stub of the CV axle until it can be pushed out of the CV joint without removing the clip. On the first one this took a lot of what I call sneak up machining to figure out the proper diameter and depth to machine to. To make the outer joint serviceable, I machined a 30 degree angle uh, into the inside uh, step on the spline. This allows the retaining clip to be compressed and the shaft to be pulled back apart again. To make the shaft easier to put together, I also machined a lead-in chamfer on the other side of the race to allow the clip to be compressed a little easier. To save the shaft for my prototype welded axles, I had to cut the outer CV joint off the axle and then cut the cage and inner race without damaging the shaft itself. I then cut the axles in half using a cutoff saw and put them in the lathe to turn a step in the shafts that would accept the tube that couples the two sides together for welding. So starting off with like a factory Jeep jack shaft, I wanted to be able to mock up the driver's side CV joint before committing to actually machining the whole jack shaft from scratch out of a piece of heat treated 4140 only to say have it be wrong. Um, so I wanted to, you know, just like my whole project where I kind of almost do everything twice, I mock it up once and then make the real thing. I took uh, basically a Jeep Commander jack shaft and machined it down to mimic what I think the proper jack shaft would be. This is the part that sticks out of the oil pan. This is where the bearings and the seal are uh, in the oil pan and this is what goes through the oil pan. Obviously it stops here and my intention is to then take a piece of Toyota shaft that I have or axle and machine the other side, the side that interfaces with the differential 
and then tack these together to create a complete mock-up axle. But in the meantime, I put this in the car, which is the whole point of this part, is to try to just proof of concept, with the CV joint plugged in, and it gets retained by this little snap ring right here. Um, like I said, this, this is not the exact same jack shaft. This is from a Jeep Liberty, and really the only difference I could figure out is that this snap ring is in a different spot. But anyways, I needed this one with the snap ring in the back here to uh, match the location in this uh, Jeep Commander slash um, uh, Jeep Cherokee, Grand Cherokee um, inner CV joint. But um, anyways, so this mimics the geometry I think I need to um, for the basically the outer half of the jack shaft. I'll put it in the car now and show you the, the mock-up in a potential issue I found. So here it is, mocked up in the car. Um, this is the driver's side once again, the opposite side where the diff is. And it all looks pretty good, and I've measured the relative position of the CV joint relative to this body seam right here. That's kind of what I'm using on both sides of the car is kind of my zero about how centered is my whole contraption in the car, basically. And I'm within a sixteenth of an inch of the CV joint that plugs directly into the diff on the other side, which is within my measurement abilities, we'll say. So, the, the, the mock-up jack shaft is seemingly correct and it puts the CV joint in the right spot but uh, I, there is an issue. In a previous episode I showed how I basically had to reposition the rack to clear this jack shaft and now here you can really see how close I was trying to cut it and in general it worked. Um, I should have about a quarter inch it looks like in real life it got a little less than that but about a quarter inch of clearance to the actual jack shaft but I, but in my head, I didn't realize how far inboard the, the CV joint would be. And I didn't take into account the diameter of the, whatever you want to call it, the, 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 the nose of the CV joint that slides over the jack shaft, right? I didn't take that into account. And there is clearance, but it's extremely tight you know I said I have my quarter inch or almost quarter inch to the jack shaft itself but basically it's almost like a sixteenth of an inch to the CV joint and so now what do I do um, to move the rack would basically delay me a weeks to a month it's totally doable I mean obviously but it would delay everything I could move the CV joint out farther which would make the you know the actual CV axle shorter which is the opposite of what I want to do so I'm going to investigate can I machine some extra material off the CV joint to get the clearance I managed to get the uh, CV joint in a four jaw chuck and dial in some uh, pretty reasonable run out to allow me to shorten it on the lathe and get some more clearance to the steering rack Here's the final product. I took 200 thousandths off the length, added a big chamfer, and then added a little chamfer on the inside to help the clip get in there. So we'll put it back in the car and see if that's enough. I didn't lose any spline, uh, just some lead in, um, so it should be no effect on strength whatsoever. Well, that helped quite a bit, but I'm going to add a little, I'm going to machine a little bit more, not off the length, but off the diameter, just to make sure it clears that bolt. Um, it has a little bit more clearance to the shaft too, but axially speaking, I think it's it's good to go. So, once again, this whole mock-up shaft was a, was a wonderful idea, and I'm glad I did it before putting chips on the, on the real shaft. So, anyways, I'll put it back in the lathe and do a little more clearancing and then move on. Here's final version number two, 
As you can see, it took quite a bit off the wall, but there's still plenty of thickness and should be okay for the application. Now that i finalized the CV shaft length, I could weld the two halves together using a tight fitting tube. The ends of the tube were cut at a 45 degree angle to increase the length of the weld and help distribute the stress more evenly. The final product turned out better than I could have imagined. The two shafts were extremely straight, all things considered. Using a lathe as a welding fixture and checking the run out as you tack the two halves together is the way to go. And finally, it was time to clean up all the parts and put the two axles together. The passenger and driver's side axles ready to go into the car for the first time. Big step. I decided pretty early on that for the first test drive I was going to use the welded CB axles, but I was still planning to machine the jack shaft from scratch before driving the car. But the axle fabrication went so well and with time running short, I made the decision to also attempt to weld a temporary jack shaft. The driver's side outer piece was already done, but I still needed to machine a piece of Toyota axle to make the other half. Once the two halves were machined except for the final length, I needed a reliable way to machine a 45 degree angle into both sides of the shaft to allow me to do some more sneak up engineering on the overall length. I didn't have a good way to accurately measure the exact length I needed inside the oil pan, such that the outer bearing would be seated and the inner clip would snap into the differential spider gear. A simple program in the CNC mill provided a repeatable way to put a 45 degree cut on the two halves of the jack shaft. I basically kept on shortening the shaft bit by bit until the snap ring would pop into the differential spider gear and this outer bearing would be completely seated in the oil pan. After mocking up the two halves in the lathe using a piece of angle aluminum to keep everything straight, I took it back apart and ground some large bevels at the joint of each part to ensure I had an adequate weld. I preheated the part and then slowly TIG welded the two halves together, constantly checking the run out to ensure it stayed straight. When the weld was filled in and proud of the surface, I machined the entire jack shaft to final size and cleaned up the entire part. The completed shaft with the bearing loctited in place and the snap ring installed ready for final installation. Even though I'm going to replace this with the machine 4140 part in the future, I'm pretty proud of how this all turned out and it was an awesome learning exercise and how to improve my welding skills. Now that the axles and jack shaft were complete, the next item on the list to get done was to get the front drive shaft installed. This required an adapter between the custom drive shaft and the output of the transfer case. This is getting to be kind of old hat, so I quickly whipped up a Design Infusion 360, 3D printed a mock-up part to ensure everything fit uh, correctly, and then started making some chips on the mill.
first side is complete, including tapping the holes. The two flats make it easier to clamp in the vise during the second operation. The part was then flipped over and the center hole was probed to get it all lined back up again. But First a fly cutter was used to machine the part to the proper height. Then the outside perimeter was machined and finally the pilot diameter was machined to locate it onto the transfer case. So here's the custom front drive shaft. Basically it's a two inch tube with uh, 1310 U-joints. I really wanted, you know, some beefy, relatively speaking, beefy U-joints, 1310. Needed a collapsing section because there's no give in the system anywhere. And then this is actually a spicer part that bolts directly to the Toyota front differential, which is kind of a unique pattern, right? So, but there's enough off-roader people that basically they make a part to adapt a 1310 U-joint right to that. It's also a very compact flange, so I had them put the same flange on both sides. So the adapter, which is already in the car now, this is the 3D printed version, I've already shown the adapter. I basically just made it mimic the uh, Toyota flange on both sides and then go to the transfer, you know, adapt it to the transfer case, which is meant for this drive shaft. This is an aftermarket drive shaft for a Dodge Charger. You can see it uses these kind of minuscule uh, CV joints and I didn't trust them. You know, they're probably strong enough. This is also too short. I'd have to make a custom one anyways and I thought if I'm going to go custom, I'm going to step up to the 1310 U joints. It isn't that much weight or that much size and now this should be uh, overkill. But anyways, the adapter goes from this pattern um, on the transfer case to the Toyota pattern to go to the basically the, the Toyota flange here. Um, so this drive shaft could go in either way because the flange is the same on both sides. And I had to made it as short as possible to basically this will be extended out as much as possible because that gives me more clearance for the catalytic converter. This is a little smaller diameter than the two inch tube. Uh, I thought about going even smaller. They do make an inch and three quarter tube. Um, but this is much more standard, I guess. This is about inch and three quarters here. And basically the catalytic converter clears, well, hopefully will clear right in here. And uh, yeah, drive shaft is in with all the bolts for the first time. You can see how it yeah, bolts directly to the differential and then clears everything just fine. And then bolts to that adapter on the transfer case plenty, uh, let's see if we get some better light here, plenty of body clearance, tons actually, I probably added more clearance than I needed, it clears the transmission and then with the little cutaway in the, in the uh, bell housing, it clears that just fine. The challenge is going to be the exhaust and getting, you can see here's the flange for the passenger side exhaust manifold and getting that to clear um, the catalytic converter is is the next major challenge because um, I want to keep it all on there at least for this fall test cruise keep the exhaust basically stock keep my super rusty crappy OEM exhaust once again this will all get replaced once everything has been sorted but right now I'm just hacking it together um, hacking the exhaust together, not the drivetrain obviously, just to drive it around and prove out the all-wheel drive. So anyways, major step, looking good. So the next challenge, right, so uh, I got the CV axles in with the custom ground control struts and everything's looking great. Um, but as you can see, I don't have it bolted in, but it's sitting in the right spot. I have the factory sway bar. Um, mounted in the car and there's very little clearance to the sway bar and this is a performance pack car so the sway bar bushings at least the stock ones are actually bonded to the to the 
sway bar and so they don't really freely rotate so this is supposed to be adjusted so that ride height um, the sway bar is sitting on its in the bushings like this now I plan on replacing the bushings to be honest to give myself more freedom in where this thing is positioned but in the meantime you know, in addition to that I think it'd be advantageous to make some spacers to basically mount the sway bar higher right and so I basically did that here so I made two one inch spacers which might be a little tall but basically just mimics the bolt pattern of this of the sway bar and will raise this the, the sway bar in the car one inch and then I bought adjustable end lengths to then tweak it in so at ride height it's hopefully close to close to neutral um, or even if I get new bushings that aren't bonded to the sway bar this will give me more clearance to the CV axle pretty simple um, mod I think that will address um, you know a, pretty, a, a, a minor issue I guess and so this was pretty easy to make I'm gonna install them and then install the end links and uh, go from there so the spacer is installed here you can see how it raised it up I think it'll clear the seam weld here because this is near the pivot point um, I made them an inch tall I can always make them shorter you can see how it adds a lot of clearance here to the to the uh, CV axle uh, even though this is at full droop it'll come up I can adjust it with my end links here so next step is to get the end links installed I bought this uh, end link kit from this company uh, German racing parts it actually came from Germany even though I'm sure it's not made in Germany it looks Chinese to be honest but Anyways, um, for the price, it was unbelievable, even shipped from Germany, because it came with all these different length links. Like, I think you can basically use it in the back or the front or in, in anything in between. And plus, I thought I might have to make a custom length, and these look like I could always cut them shorter and just re-thread them. And so, um, this seemed like a better direction, at least for the initial mock-up, um, versus, to be honest, buying the probably superior Steeda or somebody else's links but yeah I got these on eBay and it, it seemed like a, I don't know so far they look pretty good pretty quality uh, high quality ends and except with all the various links hopefully I can find one that will work for me in my completely custom setup here I ended up using the longest links and as you can see they fit pretty well So the last mechanical thing I have to address before putting it down on the ground again is you know got the front drive shaft in now for good for this test test cruise here but the exhaust basically the catalytic converter doesn't bolt on it hits the drive shaft right here right so this is all one continuous piece slightly tweaked already to clear the transfer case and so it's not even worth trying to mock up for video here it just hits right and so the next mission is I'm gonna cut this off and probably cut this off and have to re reposition the catalytic converter to clear the drive shaft it's pretty tight between the body and the drive shaft but for now I want to keep the converter and I want to just you know get it mocked up so I can drive it around for the next month or so um, I'm hoping to have maybe a half inch clearance to the drive shaft, which is probably okay, except for is it going to get too hot or, or something. But for now, I'm just going to proceed. So I'm going to cut this flange off and cut this off and figure out what do I need in between these two parts to get it positioned correctly to clear the drive shaft. I ended up just using some cardboard and shims to kind of jam the catalytic converter between the body and the drive shaft so I could tack weld the flange onto the catalytic converter. 
I then made a little piece to kind of make up the difference and weld in place until I could hog out the inside to open up the bore. So after moving the flange, it's obvious here that the opening of the flange doesn't remotely line up with the hole in the catalytic converter. So had to go in with a die grinder and go to town and make it all uh, free flowing, if you will. And here is the final product. Uh, I have to say it turned out pretty good. What is interesting, what I didn't know, is that that outer shell of the catalytic converter, at least the inlet and outlet, are two layers. They're, they're double wall with like insulation in between. You can see the white material there. And is that going to blow out long term? Well, I don't know. Either way, this is good enough for the first test cruise, just to get it all back together. Well, well that was a lot to cover so far in this video, but I didn't want to break this up into multiple videos. So we basically got the, the axles made, the CV axles made and installed, the front drive shaft made, you know, adapter made and installed, the exhaust modified, and the sway bar. So now is where the rubber hits the road, uh, um, literally. And so, but the last little thing is we didn't want to get bogged down wiring the all-wheel drive controller quite yet. And so we kind of made a little kludge, you know, the Borg Warner transfer case that uh, I'm using basically is just a 12 volt signal. It's just a coil um, that you PWM, zero to 100% you know, uh, current basically, or PWM varies the torque split. And so for now, just to see what would happen, we literally just wired in a 12 volts with a little button that we could hit just to lock it up to see what would happen on the lift. And uh, well, here's what happened. Okay, this is our we just fired the car up, it's in gear on the on the lift, and we have a beyond kludgy, just a 12 volt going to the transfer case to make it activate. Um, my friend Derek here is uh, holding the front wheel of it with a uh, glove here. I'm hitting the button, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we have all wheel drive, baby. We have all wheel drive. I was a bit nervous driving it out of the garage for the first time with all of the all-wheel drive gear actually in the car. couple weeks later and here I am driving the uh, I guess the world's first and only all-wheel drive S550 Mustang I'm just gonna cruise it around I'm gonna warm it up here kind of like last year when I was trying to test out the transmission we've had some really nice weather it's now early December and it's gonna be almost 50 degrees today so I've utilized that uh, to try to test drive the car quite a bit and 
try to prove it out. Uh, as I've already mentioned earlier in the video, you know the, current, the car currently has you know the welded axles and the welded jack shaft, um, and so I'm just trying to make sure everything works and push the envelope a little bit, you know, and, until you know, so that over the winter when I make the other parts, I'm confident they're going to be right. And I've, I've driven it quite a bit. Um, I'll add some footage here of uh, some of the under ca under car camera shots I've got with the GoPro. Maybe I'm just too much of an engineer and an all-around car geek, but I think these under car shots are just awesome. So please enjoy. This is the inner CV joint that I re-splined to plug into the Toyota Diff. And I was concerned it was going to be wobble or, be vi or vibrate. As you can see, it performed flawlessly. Basically, the first week or so, uh, I was just trying to prove out that the axles worked, right? Or the jack shaft and the axles worked. So I basically just went into parking lots and turned the wheel really tight back and forth and made big circles and forward and reverse. Uh, rose, the, uh, rose some suspicion from some of the local security guards in one of the parking lots, but oh well. Um, just trying to make sure that the travel of the CV axles is okay and uh, it was all working. Well, it, it all does work. It's been fantastic. Um, I couldn't have asked for everything to work out any better, matter of fact. And the car totally drives great. There's no torque steer. Um, there's no nothing. It It's kind of um, not good YouTube material to be honest because everything is just working. The only exception to that is, which nothing to do with the all-wheel drive per se, is I put in, uh, I don't know, a year ago now, I, I made videos about the engine mounts, maybe it was like six months ago, and how the factory engine mounts were way too stiff, or way, way too big. And I needed some uh, smaller, physically smaller engine mounts, so I just bought some BMR engine mounts that are meant for a S550 and proceeded to design the whole project around that. Well, it turns out the BMR mounts are way too stiff. Um, the whole point of this car is not to be a race car. It's to be a fast, forgiving, easy to drive car. And the BMR mounts really transmit a lot of vibration. Um, now, I had heard that they break in and that for sure is true. As I've been driving it over the course of three, four weeks here, um, I've driven it quite a bit, drove it to work a bunch of times. It has gotten better, don't get me wrong. But it's just still not good enough. Um, I drove it, I put about 50 miles on it, driving a little bit out of town. And by the end of that trip, my hands, you could, were, you could feel the vibration in the steering wheel so bad that my hands were kind of numb. So, but that's not a big deal. Um, I think I can address it. You know, I said I'm making a laundry list of things I'm going to work on over the winter. 
and uh, that's just one of them. A um, couple different options there. One is just make some softer pucks for the uh, BMR mounts and keep it the way it is or try to design it in a different mount. Uh, our current plan is probably to make softer pucks. Make some 60 durometer pucks that fit the existing mounts. So the other minor, even more minor issue is the rear drive shaft. Um, which I might have mentioned this even last fall when I drove it around with no all-wheel drive stuff in the front is that I'm getting a little bit of a vibration between 60 and 70 miles an hour from the rear drive shaft and um, I got to do a measure the angles and see what's going on there and try to address that over the winter too um, but that is also not a deal breaker to be honest it's a more minor thing than the motor mounts I'm going to focus on the motor mounts first Otherwise, I've just been driving the heck out of it. The weather has been really weird here for Minnesota. Not only has it been warm, but it's been really dry. And so, you know, once again, not good YouTube footage. Um, I've been uh, waiting, you know, for either a slightly snowy day or a rainy day. Um, really, I wanted a rainy day uh, to try to show the traction ability of the car. It definitely adds a lot of traction. It, you can't spin the tires, and that's the so the the story is that basically a all-wheel drive Mustang with stock horsepower, 200 and, or excuse me, 435 horsepower, and a 295 Extreme Contact Sport uh, tires all the way around, square setup has just crap loads of traction, as you can imagine, and so with 435 horsepower. There's, there's no doing four-wheel drive burnouts without maybe really beating on the clutch. And so um, it's been a little uneventful. The thing just works. And it goes like a bat on hell within the, the factory horsepower. Uh, you can punch it in the corners. You can punch just like I always dreamed. It never goes sideways. You can punch it in the corners, punch it on a ramp. Um, now I want to try all that when it's raining. <laughs> But it hasn't rained in a long time, at least enough to matter. Uh, I drove it one day to work and it was supposed to rain. It just missed it. It didn't do much um, for, for me there. But uh, anyways, um, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit here and showing you the thing all working. So after that last shot of, uh, or it was on the, on the rack, the next job was to put in the all-wheel drive controller. Here's the Cyvex generic all-wheel drive controller I'm going to use in the car. Um, it's pretty compact. It does have a built-in uh, accelerometer, so it really should be mounted near the center of the car. So it's going to go in the center console of the car, and then this connector has to face the back of the car. So yeah, after getting the car running mechanically and driving it around, the next step was to get the all-wheel drive controller working. And I ended up going with this Cyvex controller um, for most of the project up until recently. I planned on going with this what's called an ETS Pro, and which I think would have worked too, don't get me wrong. But the advantage of the Cyvex controller uh, is that it's CAN-based. And so by hooking basically only two wires up to the CAN bus of the car, I get all of the inputs I needed versus having to run separate wires to everything. So I got throttle position. I got steering angle, which is pretty awesome. I got all four wheel speed sensors. I got average vehicle velocity. Um, I can get brake pressure. I can get whatever you want I can get now and use that to control the all-wheel drive. So the default maps in the controller are set up for basically throttle versus speed, um, and then steering angle takes away basically the um, lockup, and then it's got different slip functions, front slip, rear slip, and then center slip, which is your main one, which is the difference between the front and rear wheel speeds, right? And that's the one I'm, I'm focusing on. We also could have it like say, <clears throat> If you had an open rear diff, you could have rear slip. So if like just one wheel um, starts spinning too fast in the back, you could add all-wheel drive. And so it's very, very customizable. And there's also then a potentiometer to be able to have a, a, a global gain. Um, there's a switch to go to two-wheel drive mode. And I can add another switch too to have different uh, tunes, if you will, like a drag tune, a snow tune, uh, whatever. 
whatever whatever you want it's very very flexible and so far that's been very uh, working very well uh, my friend Derek helped me get the can working um, most of the can variables were I could, could find online about what the address was and the bit length and all that kind of good stuff the only one that was a little bit tricky was the steering angle uh, we had to do a little sniffing on the uh, can bus to find that one but we got it figured out and that now works too so now when you're in a parking lot and you're turning the wheel tight it actually subtracts from the duty cycles it basically unlocks the transfer case so you don't crap in a parking lot uh, but if you were to punch it in, in a tight turn you'd then detect the the slip angle between the front and rear wheels and it would add it back in right so it's all about tuning so all that has to get figured out and tuned and I need some to be on it on it's not perfect conditions to do that and it's been almost too nice uh, I need some rain maybe some little bit of snow um, and we'll go from there but to try to tune it so a lot of that will probably have to happen in the spring we're not going to get any more rain it's just going to go from being 50 degrees and nice to snow probably in a week so um, my chance of tuning in the snow is not going to happen enjoyed those uh, all-wheel drive uh, burnouts or whatever you want to call them they were obviously pretty fun to do but there was a reason for it uh, in between each one of those shots I was tweaking the all-wheel drive controller to kind of dial it in and it did require a little bit of tweaking uh, from the dry conditions and there'll be more tuning in the spring when I have have more time but uh, yeah it, it was it was really a blast I have to say so now People have asked how much weight have I added to the car. Uh, obviously I've added a lot of stuff and so while well, the answer is I borrowed some scales and I weighed it and it weighs 3915 pounds as it sits right now which is better than I expected to be honest so it's really under 200 pounds of additional weight I think um, and I have at least 20 some pounds of weight reduction already planned. I have two piece front rotors for it which is like 22 pounds I feel I can probably save some weight when I redo the motor mounts, make some stuff out of aluminum. And so I'm hoping to get it into the mid to 3,800 pound range. That's before, of course, adding any kind of power adder, which gets me to what's next on the project. Well, obviously all the things I've already mentioned, make the real 4140 axles, jack shaft, um, get rid of the crusty exhaust. Um, and uh, adjust the motor mount vibration. But the main project, what I really have to get, want to get done by spring, is I want to boost the car. Um, I've mentioned before, I never would have done this project if I wasn't going to boost it. And at the stock power levels, really, it's got so much traction now, it's, it's kind of crazy. And so that is the goal, is get the things I've already mentioned done and then have enough time to get it boosted by spring. Um, so I want to drive it all next summer and go to car shows, uh, go to the drag strip, uh, go to autocross, maybe some open track events, but mostly just drive the heck out of it and have fun. 
Um, I've been working on the car for a couple of years now and I just want to drive the heck out of it and prove out the suspension. You know, I put all new springs in it, prove out the all-wheel drive and just have a blast. So that is the goal. So if you want to see all that, uh, please like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you know when new episodes are out. And until then, thanks for watching.